Hello, my name is Tucker Johnson, and you are experiencing Nimsy Live, and I will be your host today. And let me see if I can, I'm having audio problems here, I'm going to cut that audio. All right, let's try this again. Hello, my name is Tucker Johnson, and I am your host today as we experience Nimsy Live, where we talk about the latest and greatest in translation, localization, internationalization, culturalization, and all of that fun stuff that global companies need to delight their international customers, or at least not to piss them off too much. On this program, we invite guests who like to have fun and have some value to add for our audience of globalization professionals. I'm always eager to provide a platform to those with a good story or a good data set. So let us know if there are any topics you'd like covered or guests we should reach out to for future episodes. If you aren't already subscribed to Nimsy, now's your chance. If you're watching this and you hit that subscribe or follow button, whatever platform you're logging in from, then you will be one of the first people to be informed when we have new live streams or we publish new research from Nimsy in Insights. A uh, quick plug for some upcoming events. We have one event. Uh, we have a couple. We have a bunch of events, but not all of them are published yet. But keep an eye on Limsy's LinkedIn page, and you will see that on March 29th, Wednesday, March 29th, we're going to be talking with Eventbrite's Veronica DiMartino about language inclusivity and accessibility. And we're kind of kicking off into... Uh, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion kick here. We got a number of good guests lined up for you. Um, and if you're subscribed to NIMSY Insights, then you will be notified when those go live and when you can sign up for those. Quick introduction to the platform for those of you that haven't joined us before. Uh, we're doing this as a host, or we're hosting this on LinkedIn events. And if you're joining us live, then welcome. You can take advantage of the comments section and we'll bring your comments, questions up on screen. We can answer those live. If you're watching the recording, as many of you do, then you should know that we also will archive these recordings on Nimsy's YouTube channel, which you can also go subscribe to. Uh, if anything comes up during the presentation and the stream gets cut on LinkedIn for whatever reason, just hop on over to our YouTube channel and it's still going strong usually over there. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce today's topic and guest. Today we're going to be talking about the 2023 Web Globalization Report Card. And this is from Byte Level Research. We're going to hear why websites like Wikipedia, Airbnb, and Bosch have made it to the top of the annual ranking of the best global websites. We will also be discussing the latest language trends and global navigation best practices. The discussion features the recently published 2023 report card, and we're going to have an engaging conversation with John Yunker, uh, co-founder of Byte Level Research, who I will introduce now. John Yunker is the co-founder of Byte Level Research. You can find that at www.bytelevel.com. And he is considered one of the world's experts in web globalization. Since 2000, he has worked with the world's leading global brands to provide web globalization training and consulting services. He pioneered best practices in global navigation and is the author of the books, The Art of the Global Gateway and Think Outside the Country. He is also widely known for the landmark report, which we are discussing today, the Web Globalization Report Card. John, welcome back to NIMSY Live. Tucker, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming on. I, I, we were just saying 10 minutes ago, I haven't seen you for a year since, <laughs> since you published the 2022 report card. And that was a really yeah. interesting conversation we had back then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm a year older and uh, a few months wiser. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. I can yeah. relate to that. <laughs> well, let's dive right in. I don't want to take it for granted that people know exactly what is uh, the, the Web Globalization Report Card, because not everybody's a fanboy that waits for it to come out every year so I can get to talk to you on the show. Um, maybe you can start off and give us a quick intro. What is the report all about? Well, the report is the benchmarking of the websites of many of the world's leading global brands. And it's it's an old report in the sense that I first started it back in 2003. And at the time, 
as as you 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 know, Tucker, web globalization was a relatively uh, novel practice. Mm. There weren't many companies doing it, right. and I was doing it uh, as part of uh, localization. And there weren't really any best practices that I could see uh, that I could see when I did my internet searching and whatnot. And so the report card came out of that when I went independent as a researcher. I thought, well, gosh, wouldn't it be great if there were something very simple, like a report card? Right. And you you pull together these these brands, these websites, look at what they're doing well, not so well. Talk to the people who manage these websites, find out what's working, what's not working. So it's both a reflection of the state of the internet, but it's also a very uh, opinionated report. Okay. Because I'm trying to push companies forward. So that, for example, or you're trying to raise the bar. I'm trying to raise the bar. Right. And and one of the four metrics, of course, is is global reach, which is languages. And if you want a perfect score of 25 points in that one area, you've got to support 50 or more languages. And as we know, very few websites support 50 or more languages. So it's opinionated in that respect saying, you know, if you want to be global, you've got to really be global. And it's not just 10 languages and you're global. It's you've got to really try to speak to the world and get to that 50 language uh, baseline. So that's one of the four metrics in the, in the report. Well, let, let's let's go there. You started started us yeah. down that that path with the four metrics. Uh, the first mm-hmm. one is global reach, which is a fancy way of saying how many languages mm-hmm. are you localizing. Then we got global mm-hmm. navigation, global Correct. mobile architecture, and mm-hmm. localization and social. Can we talk a little mm-hmm. bit about each one of those? Yeah. So global navigation is is an area that that often gets overlooked and it's it's an area that i put a lot of effort into because it's kind of the low-hanging fruit uh, it's an area that it, it, at, a, at, a, at a it's a front door to your website so you create a a localized website you invest all this money and then you discover six months later that not a lot of people are visiting the website and you wonder why maybe it's global navigation maybe you haven't provided a really uh, holistic, uh, language, language agnostic uh, uh, strategy to, to directing users to all of these localized websites you've, recre- you've seen. And in fact, if you look at the, the poster behind me, it's a map I designed many years ago that displays country codes, country codes of the world. And that is one of the techniques that companies utilize to provide front doors, local front doors to their, to their many websites. And there's, there's components to, to global navigation, but that's just one of, one of many. You brought up yeah. maps. I'm going to come back to that. We'll put a pin yeah. in that. I'll let you get through. Put a pin in that. Yeah, I'll yeah. put a pin in maps and flags. I always Ma- want to hear oh. your rant about maps and flags. Don't get me started on Because flags. people need to hear it. People need to hear yeah. about flags still. But anyways, we'll, we'll get to that. So global navigation. Yes. yes. Architecture. Uh, and then and then you, you mentioned international internationalization and localization. So yep. the, the other two metrics fall into those two camps. So internationalization is your global template, your architecture, developing, designing a website and app to scale. Uh, and if you do that well, then the localization aspect becomes a lot easier down the road. And that's the, the true never ending journey of, of the content, which includes social content, uh, you know, machine translation uh, and all of all that that entails as well. Um, and, and keep in mind, the, the report card is really customer facing. So I'm not focused on the customer doesn't care, you know, how you're organized, what tools you're using. The they customer just cares if they want to find their content, they want to buy a product, they want to uh, get support for something, and they, they can live in any country, speak any language. And your job is to get them where they want to go and help them accomplish their task as quickly and as seamlessly as possible. Yeah, and, and people are spoiled these days. If they need three seconds to figure out how to navigate your web, three seconds is an eternity when browsing yeah. the web, especially on mobile. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, and that and performance, I actually take that into account in, in terms of architecture, I actually weigh websites. Uh, a lot of people think uh, perform, you know, performance gets talked a lot. It's like the weather. Everyone talks about it, but not, not, no one seems to do anything about it because websites every year get heavier and heavier. And when you think globally, oh. you, you're, you have to think about slower networks, yep. older devices, yep. uh, and you know the companies that really understand that. You know the, the, the you know the Facebooks of the world. That's why you'll see more. Uh, they'll develop uh, parallel, lightweight mobile apps mm-hmm. for uh, for India, for example. So there's a whole other 
avenue to that, but I do look at weight and that actually figure figures into the scoring methodology. And how does, does this overlap um, or how do you see this overlapping with you know, buzzwords like ex accessibility and inclusivity these days? Is there an inclusivity component to this as far as making your websites um, from an architectural standpoint accessible? Absolutely, absolutely, because you, you, you know, at a, at, a, at a basic level, you know, one of the early best practices in this field was don't embed text within images, mm. because that gets locked, you can't access that, and that's going to have carryover uh, into accessibility as well. So really developing a, a sound text-based uh, architecture. Uh, really separating text from code, all text, that's metadata as well as your, as your, your, your text, so that you can uh, more easily enable an accessible website. Now, it doesn't, I, accessibility was not, is not in scope of the report card, but inclusivity is just a recurring, you know, it's, it's a buzzword these days. It's a buzzword, yeah. but we've been doing but it. We've been, yeah, this entire field. Exactly. Is based on inclusivity. Exactly. It's about showing respect your customers around the world, no matter what language they speak. Uh, and, and that's what we're all about. And I've, you know, I've always said, you, you, when you talk to a, a US-based multinational, they don't spend a lot of time uh, arguing over the ROI of an English language website. It's assumed. But boy, they will, they will wrestle you to the mat over the ROI of a, a <laughs> Vietnamese-based website. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not dismissing ROI. I think it's valuable, but it's, it, there is a bias there, an inherent bias that we in this field are always working against and, and fighting against. Well, and much like any bias or most biases yeah. out yeah. there, it's born out of non-malicious ignorance, I would say, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it's just ignorance because like, oh, well, can't you just Google Translate the website, you know? And yeah, yeah, you chuckle, I chuckle, yeah. Yeah. but that's a perfectly logical question yeah. to ask. For most people mm -hmm. out there so Absolutely. social how does social play into the report card <clears throat> social plays into it um as a way of of an unlocking and um creating and fostering fresher content if you will and fostering communities at, at the local level um you know i'm a big fan if you can leverage social networks in the markets um, but what, and, and many companies do that, but then they, what they don't is, they don't, what they don't do is connect the dots. So they don't embed, for example, if they support Twitter or, or Instagram or whatnot, they don't really connect the dots on their local, local, localized websites. Um, and the problem there is um, the localized websites often <laughs> tend to look pretty stale sometimes. They don't invest a lot there. Right. Um, so if you, if all you do it, if you've got, if you've got some thought leaders on Twitter in your company, Deloitte, uh, KPM, Deloitte does this and, and professional service companies have done generally a pretty good job of this because they're all about content and thought leadership. And so you go to their localized websites in Spain, for, for example, and you'll often see, uh, some of their, uh, their consultants. Um, you'll see links to their social feeds, some embedded content. It just, it creates more pers personable, fresher, um, and, it, and it allows, you know, visitors to connect with the local experts. And so if you can leverage that, um, I really recommend you do that. All right. So now we know how, how the report card is graded, mm -hmm. who is graded, what kind of companies <laughs> are, do you feature in this? And you know, looking at your website, once again, everybody is bitelevel.com. You list a ton, a yeah, ton of companies. Here. There's 150, and I, I've capped it at 150. And 80% of those also overlap with the interbrand, best global brand. So I, I do I do want to include the, the, you know, the most widely recognized brands around the world. But I also want to include a diversity of, of industry sectors. So okay. you, you're at 12 industries, if you will, that are shown through there. So it's not just B2C, it's B2B. Uh, it skews a little heavily more towards travel, definitely, and, and you know, uh, pure tech companies. But I, I wanted, one of the goals here is to 
break companies out of their silos, executives that manage com uh, websites within a particular industry and, and look across the industries. Because as you mentioned earlier, um, you know, that three, three second threshold, you know, we, if you, if you're developing a website uh, and you're just focused on your nearest term competitors, you have to think about who's doing the best job period. Yeah of yep. developing, of delivering a user experience. So you've got to be aware of what <laughs> Amazon's doing, what Google's doing, what are some of these companies that are really about scale and, and, and localization and, 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 and being aware that that's your competition, even if they're not in your industry. So yeah. that's why I look at the diversity of industries. Well, we get, we get kind of, as consultants here at NIMSI and as a consultant, I'm sure you get this a lot too, where, uh, a company will want us to audit their localization and provide some benchmarking data. And they say, we want to, we want to benchmark our localization processes against our comp competition. Ah. And my question is always, well, who cares? Like best practices are best practices. Like who cares what your competition is doing? Let's benchmark your localization processes against the best localization processes yeah. in the yeah. world out there. Yeah. Right. It, right. it doesn't matter. As you said, the end user doesn't care. They don't care. Right? No. And so yeah. you mentioned, we mentioned a couple in the, in the intro, a couple companies, and I don't right. want to, you know, if, hey, guys, if you want the report, go pay for it. It's on the website. Mm -hmm. But um, can you give us any sneak peeks? Some, like, what, some of the companies that are really doing things right out there that made the, the top yeah, of the list? Yeah, well, I, and I, I have a blog post as well, the industry leaders within each of those 12 industries, because some of these folks are not in the top 25. The top 25, you know, Wikipedia is number one. Um, sure. You know, for a lot of reasons, which should be obvious I'm, to anyone who uses Wikipedia. I'm guessing I'm a, the, yeah. the Mormons are probably on there somewhere. Or the they're, they're in the top, top tier. Linguistically, they are, definitely. Um, but Airbnb has done well, you know, oh, here we go. Here are the industries. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so let's look down the list because one thing I think is relevant is uh, some industries are just not as sophisticated uh, from a globalization perspective as others, say luxury. Mm -hmm. So Cartier is number one in that category, but it's not in the top 25. Oh, okay. So if, Car okay. if Cartier were to say, well, I'm going to develop the best website, I'm only look at my competitors, that's fine. But you still only support, I think they support fewer than 10 languages. They're, they're over, the websites in luxury are, tend to be horribly overweight navigation is often a sore spot in, in luxury websites because they just they don't really put much investment in that. Uh, but if you look at, say, travel and hospitality, Airbnb bubbles up not just within that sector, but I think it's number three overall. And, and they, you know, for them, of course, it's all about scale. They yeah. support over 60 languages. They are really pioneering customer consumer facing machine translation. They're, they're doing amazing stuff over there. Yeah. I mean, just think yeah. of not yeah. only the amount of content, but the yeah. amount of what's essentially user generated content, right? Yes. Because yeah. hosts will have their property descriptions and stuff and they have to machine translation, translate mm -hmm. all of that. And by golly, it's working for them. Yeah. And the key, I think the key with, well, with translation in general and the machine translation in, in particular is managing expectations. And I think if you look at how they do that from a UI perspective, I think they've, they've, you know, most recently they've made some changes and tweaks, uh, but it, it, they do a really good job of letting the user know, okay, we're going to be machine translating this, mm -hmm. you know, so you know what you're getting into. And I'm sure there's, a, I'm sure there's a legal element to that as well. But um, so the user stays in control of his or her experience. Okay. But what you're not doing is saying, I'm not going to let you have access to this content because it's not in your language or because it hasn't been professionally translated right. yet. Um, giving so them it, options. It, you're unlocking, you're giving the, the control is in the user's hands um, and they know what they're getting into once they say, yeah, sh show me the machine translated content. So it's a good way to both unlock content, but not over promise on the quality of that content. <laughs> right. It kind of hedge your bets <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Right. Well, how have you, has this come up at all in the years that you've been doing this? Because how do I phrase this? How have user expectations shifted over the years? Because by my estimations, it seems not only is machine translation, for example, getting better, but user users' expectations 
like users tolerance for machine translated content is actually getting better too. Mm -hmm. I think as a society, we're more trained to accept lower production value, lower, um, whatever it may be, lower, mm -hmm. um, quality of machine translation. And it's just kind of becoming normalized in people's mm -hmm. expectations. Have you come across anything like that in your research? With shifting user I, expectations? Yeah, yeah, I, I would, I yes, I have seen that. Um, and and the only, the only, you know, caveat is when the dollar comes out of the wallet, at which yeah. point that's where, Fair. that's where the, the rubber hits the road for some consumers. Um, but you're right, I think I mean, generally we, we are, uh, through social networks, providing, you know, on-demand machine translation through, you know, what Airbnb is doing, we are getting spoiled. And so then what happens is when I, when I have talked to companies, I, I say, look, you support 12 languages, but do you, do you know how many people are machine translating your website already hmm. and into what languages? So maybe you need to get ahead of that instead of letting, you know, having some more control of the narrative, more control of the experience. Because Airbnb is in its own way getting ahead of that. They're, they're saying, we know machine translation can offer value, but let's control that and, and optimize it versus letting someone just, you know, do it ad hoc and, and hope for the best. And, um, but, but no, as I would you, agree with you. As you say, and I, I steal this and I use this all the time, but it's totally your line. If you don't translate your website, somebody else will. Exactly. Right. That's right. And yeah. then you lose control over it. Yeah. And I've heard interesting case studies from clients that we work with at NIMSI where they get stuck with terminology that they don't like because their content was being translated in a certain market before they translated it. So now it's like they're forced to use this terminology because if they use their own terminology, then yeah. nobody's going to understand what they're talking about. That's a great <laughs> point. That is a great point. No, you're absolutely right. Um, it is the, the genie is out of the bottle, so to speak. And it's, um, you do have to, I think companies need to embrace a, a degree of chaos. And, and it was much harder to make that case five years ago, but mm -hmm. now, well, you know, with AI, you know, we've been living with AI to a degree for many years. And now the world in general is, is getting oh, just, just like with any technology, it exists yeah. for a yeah. while yeah. and then it becomes publicly accessible. Right. Right. So now we're kind of in that phase with chat GPT and I promised myself I wasn't going to turn the conversation to chat GPT because yeah, sure. every conversation goes towards chat GPT. It seems like right. these days, right. but it's, we're in the era where AI is just becoming more and more accessible to people. Yeah. Like I can mm -hmm. use it. A schmuck like me can use it. You don't need to have a PhD in programming in order mm -hmm. to implement it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for the, we were talking about the websites that are doing really good and we're not going to name any names here, but I thought it would be interesting. I'm sure you have some horror stories to tell, like some, what are, what are some big faux pas that people, the company should not be doing and they still are in 2023? Well, you, you alluded to it earlier, flags. Flags. All right, let's talk about flags. Why, why are flags, first of all, what, what, in what context for those in the audience? Flags that may not know. Uh, specifically for navigation. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Apple, you know, I, I had been hammering against Apple for 10 years to drop flags because the reason why is, is for years, I would consult and I'd say, you really should drop flags from your global gateway menu. Um, and they say, well, Apple's doing it. So it must yeah. be the best way to go. A lot of companies uh, have that answer for a lot yeah. of different questions. Yeah. I, I've heard, right. well, we just do what Apple does. Right. Like they're kind of a bellwether for every, yeah. their, people follow them. So. so yeah, two years ago, Apple dropped flags, finally. Okay. Um, thankfully, and that's made my life. I've slept a lot easier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, flags, you know, flags are, are risky from a variety of reasons, obviously geopolitical reasons. Sure. Um, if, if you're curious, you could go to PayPal, case in point, they use flags still. And if you go to their global gateway menu, you will see a missing flag for a, um, a region um, or country based on what part of the world you are from. 
uh, for Taiwan. So they will not use the flag for Taiwan. And it's really, really noticeably absent on their website. Um, and in my argument, th that's just one reason. Um, but yeah, you can you, get in you, trouble for which flags you are using and you can get you in can trouble. get in trouble with flags that you're using or not using or incorrectly using. OK, so here's PayPal. Uh, let's go to Asia. Oh, we're, we're taking you to task. Wait, PayPal's not a NIMSY client, I don't think. So I think we're good. I think we're good. <laughs> OK, OK. Uh, so we scroll down here and let's look for Taiwan. And what do we see? We see a globe. Taiwan. Yeah, we see a globe. It's a noticeably yeah. missing flag. You know, and there's so, no. Something's not like, or one thing here is not like yeah. the others. Right? Yeah. And also, also, there are no flags for regions. A lot of companies have regional websites. So when they have a, uh, and Apple was an example of this, they had a, a Latin American regional website. So they didn't have a flag for the region. So they just yeah. put in a, some sort of widget. I forget what they used exactly, but it's not the most scalable. Um, there are geopolitical issues and, geo and, and, you know, your global gateway is not where you want to wade into geopolitical issues. There's no reason for it. Um, why, why pick on that headache? That's not your, right. why pick, why pick this, that battle? There's not much. This to is gain. just about, yeah, this is just about navigation. This is about getting your, this is an interstitial. This is just a sign that the user hits on the way to somewhere else. Um, so you want to make their journey as painless as possible. And when you splash all those flags, it's just a lot of the same colors. They're not the usability uh, is is inversely relational relational to the number of flags you display, and and I've I've seen research according to that fact. But um, so, having said that, um, flags can I have seen them more successfully used within say e-commerce uh, circumstances. So, on on a header in a website that that tells you you're at the right place. I okay. you know a banking website, for example, where security and trust are really, really important. The user wants to know they're on the right country website. I can see the value for a flag there at the header, but that's not navigational. That's providing a slightly different uh, usage uh, scenario. Right. So if you can avoid flags, um, I think you will you will generally be in, in good hands. Am I am I correct that I heard, but I didn't actually like read read anything about it because I'm lazy. But isn't Unicode even stopping because the not stopping the current flags, but they're not taking submissions for new flags to be added. I did not know you that. You haven't heard that? All right. Well no, audience and chat, maybe one of you guys knows about it. Yeah, I'd be I'd love to learn. Speaking of which, we've got yeah. uh let's see here. Uh Jeff Allen is asking, John Yunker, okay. you mentioned Twitter as a social approach. I'm the owner of the Twitter tile in one of our corporate content dissemination apps yeah. slash sites. We recently had to temporarily deprecate that tile that I carefully designed ah, to pull in dynamic yeah. content from various related industries. Yeah. The Twitter API issue. So yes. you know what's yes. going on here. I'm Yeah, I, Twitter's monetizing their API. So they're they're they've shut down their API. Damn right? you, Elon. Yeah. Got, got to pay the bill, you know, they, they're having that, trouble covering That $8 it. a month isn't cutting it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, so that's a good point. So, yeah, once they turn off the API spigot, you need to pivot. And is there a better way to embed a Twitter feed? Um, you know, there. I'm thinking aloud here, you know, maybe you can scrape it, pull it, and then and then there, there's going to be a little bit of manual work, perhaps, uh, unless you can pull and cache that API and then use it that way. But I, I guess if they're shutting the API down to get altogether, maybe Twitter's not going to work as well. Or what? whoever's creating that content in Twitter, can you give them a, a door into an embedded spot on the website? Mm. So you do need to, you're right, you need to be nimble with, you know, API strategies in general, there's always potential points of failure if the, if the door gets closed. And, and Twitter is absolutely a wild card these days. <laughs> well, and it's the problem with any integrations with your website yeah. is it, all it takes is one update, right? If I have everything integrated, one update from one of yeah. those companies and everything breaks and yeah. it's just constant, yeah. constant maintenance. Um, you mentioned one thing I want to go back to the the languages. You said you know forty eight fifty languages is kind of where you'd like to see companies offering on their mm -hmm. websites. Does it matter which languages? Like, do you, John Juncker, have a list of languages that you can say these are the languages you need to go into? How how do companies go about choosing 
which markets they want to represent in their language offering? Oh boy. Uh, yeah, you know, that that's a great question. I, you know, you don't want to just add languages for the sake of adding languages um, necessarily. Um, when companies go about this, they there's a mix of, of, of processes. It, you know, it can be driven by your business goals. It can be driven by where your customers are at. Um, it can be driven by where you want to go. Um, mm. But uh, I will say speaking, you know, speaking of languages, there's actually this, I don't know if I mentioned this, but this is the first year when the average number of languages actually dropped slightly. I've done this 19, this is the 19th report. So every year, it's been a, just a slow but steady uptick in, a, in aggregate. So if you look at all of the websites and you count all the languages, every year it would go up a little bit. And so last year we were right around 34 languages and that's across all 150 websites. Okay. And this year we hit, we dropped the first time it's dropped to an average of 33 languages. Why? And, is the obvious why? question. Well, I mean, I know it's not your yeah. fault, but no. wh no. why would you? Why do you speculate that's happening? The on a, a def, definite the one biggest factor would be Russia, the pullback. Okay, okay so roughly oh. a dozen to two. Do I think between a dozen and twenty websites that I track for have dropped Russia, or they've completely pulled out of Russia altogether. So, and this has been it. It started, you know, in last year's report card. You could see it a little bit. But in the in the in the past twelve months, they've uh, definitely pulled back. But that alone is was not enough to to impact the average uh, to the extent that it was. So it was Russia was the biggest component. You know, I hate to use this word deglobalization, but there there is a little bit of that going on. And I would argue it's like, more not to the extent, not to like the panic inducing extent no. that the talking heads on TV want you to believe. No, no, no. But. Yeah, it's a factor, it's, right? Yeah, it's, it's and it's and it's it's the economy, it's the economy, and so you know with layoffs and so forth, a lot it, it, low teams take a larger chunk of the have taken a lot larger chunk of the blow in many companies, um, and I would argue, and I've argued in the report card that one of the reasons mm -hmm. is a lot of localized websites are not really have not really been deployed and maintained to the level that they needed to be so yep. that they couldn't be cut. You know, they weren't valuable. Right. And so that I, in some cases I call them local facades, you know, they would launch it to check a box, say we launched a website for Bulgaria done. Let's yep. move on to something else, but they never paid attention to that market. They the website in it. I've seen yeah. like local websites that are, ba they're not websites. It's, it's a landing page, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like yeah. one page that's, yeah doesn't look anywhere as nice as the website. Half the links are broken. And the other half go back to English sites, English pages, <laughs> right? I've, I've seen those so there's, too. There, there's an absolute rate reset with it going on in, in a number of companies. And it's not bad. Um, it's, it could be quite healthy. And I, I don't think we're gonna see a, I, I wouldn't be surprised if next year is flat, given where yep. we're at right now, but um, you know, companies need to, you know, need to do a better job of managing their, their goals with these, with these sites. They, a lot of times they have no expectations or they have unrealistically high expectations, mm -hmm. which of course becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because you, you, if you have an unrealistic, unrealistically high expectation for this site, a year passes, it hasn't achieved the goals. You pull the plug. Um, and then it's, it's a, a tragedy on multiple levels because, I have seen companies, and I won't name them, who have pulled localized websites for markets, and then a year passes, and they go back into that market all over again. Yeah. And so then they, you know, start from scratch. Start from scratch. Yeah. Exactly. What about languages? Um, you know, languages. You know, we're always talking about French, Italian, German, Spanish. You know, mm -hmm. the figs mm -hmm. languages. The figs. Right. Uh, what about you know Arabic, Hindi, Vietnamese? Like mm -hmm. these longer tail languages or more complex languages, like bi-directional yes. languages, right? Oftentimes yeah. there's a disproportionate amount of investment required to go into Arabic or Hebrew, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. because it requires restructuring. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on those languages? Well, I, I, I love Arabic. I took, took, I took an Arabic class years ago. I, I, I love the bi-directional bi scripts in general. Mm -hmm. um, and 
but they are more complicated to support sure. uh, technically and uh and it's more expensive usually to to translate and support um but they there some of these uh you know not top 10 languages uh vietnamese in particular has actually seen significant growth over the past two years okay. um and in india that's <laughs> You know, there's a India, lot of official language, what are like 44 right? or something? There's a lot of Someone's going to correct language. me in chat. But yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And we, it, sadly, um, it's still under 10%. So, report card, what I do in the report card is I look at not just the number of languages, I actually look at the languages supported by each website. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, if we look at Hindi, for example, that's, I think, around 9 or 10% support. So, okay. it's really low still. Uh, Amazon, you know, amped up the investment slightly over the past two years. A lot of other companies are still just clinging to the dream that they can do English only and that'll, that'll get them where they want to go. Um, and why, you know, why is that wrong? Cause I've heard that so much. I'd like someone who knows what they're talking about, like you to comment on that. Why is it wrong to say, well, India is an English speaking market. I don't, you know, you know, all of these other languages are nice to have. I'm playing devil's well, advocate here. Yeah, no, I know. It's, I just, I, you know, it, I, you can make, I can see the case. Kirti Vashi's, Kirti's Vashi's calling us out, says you are wrong about India and Hindi. All right. Tell us why we're wrong, Kirti. Yeah. Hindi is spoken by at least 500 million people. Oh, he's saying I'm yeah. wrong. Of oh. course I'm wrong. I'm playing devil's yeah, advocate yeah, here, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, um, the B2B companies that go into India, India make, you know, I, they make potentially a more compelling case, but if you're a B2C company, you're right. Yeah. Um, that, that's the it's difference. It's insulting. Right? It's insulting, you know, but you know, one of the reasons companies do avoid it is, is because it's almost like the paradox of choice. They go, okay, now if I, they're, they're worried if I pick three languages in India, then, then I piss off all these other language speakers. That I, other languages that I'm not supporting. So is it eight languages? Is it three? Is it eight? Is it 10 or is it 12? I, so I think that kind of scares them. Yeah. And, and I, and I can see that. Um, but. I was it, just having this conversation. We were doing a readout. Yeah. We're doing a yeah. user experience study for, for a client of ours and looking mm -hmm. at Switzerland and we're talking about Swiss German which really? is like a specific dialect, but then each town has their own dialect, right? So we're looking at this different feedback and I obviously I'm not gonna name the company, but looking at this different feedback and the feedback is, oh, we wish we could have it more adapted into our local dialect, right? And mm -hmm. it becomes, well, which dialect, right? And someone made the comment, the client made the comment, it was like, well, better to discriminate equally <laughs> against everybody rather than, because you, you risk, you know, alienating people. So yeah. in, in India, if I go into these three languages, maybe yeah. the thought process is, well, am I alienating the rest? Let's see what Kirti yeah. has to say. Yeah. I'm always surprised how little the language landscape is understood by experts. If you want to get local, you need at least five languages other than English. Here, 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 yeah. Keep yeah. preaching it. Uh, you know, yeah, well, you he, know Kirti's he, blog, yes. right? Yeah, okay, everyone yeah. knows Kirti's yeah. blog. I'll Definitely. give you a plug there, Kirti. Um, well, universal Spanish or universal English to that point goes to that. You know that idea that you can create this one language that works everywhere. Um, but, you know, if you look at, uh, uh, you're, you're starting, you're, you're now seeing companies that, that may have started that way, and then they get into uh, variations of English, obviously. You know, it, it, 10 years ago on the report card, it was US English pretty much everywhere. Hmm. Um, and I would consult and I'd say, well, what about British English or, you know, um, oh, no, 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 we don't need to do that. Well, it's amazing now. That's it. UK, British English is at 80% now uh, in the report. Card. Okay. So eight out of 10. So it didn't used to be that. It was like two out of 10 websites. So that, you know, there there is a balance, but um, I'm not quite seeing the same uh, trends yet on Spanish. Um, we're seeing, of course, with Google and, you know, 
the large tech companies, but not at, uh, you know, at a, what I, when I consult with companies, sometimes I'll say, just do, just get started. Just, you know, you start with universal Spanish and then go to the just next. Go. You know, just right. go. Right. Yeah. And yeah, the, don't let the paradox, I, I guess that would be the advice to people. Don't let right. paradox of choice keep you right. from making any choice. Yeah. Like, and know the, and know the risks you're facing. And as you noted in your, your, the intro to this is be sensitive to not pissing people off. You know, you have to really be aware of that. But if, if you know the risks going in, you can, you can manage that, I think. Yeah. Well, you've been doing this, oh, Kirti, digital presence and language need to be covered for India. I would say Hindi, Tamil, Bengali, Marathi, Marathi yeah. Telugu uh, yeah. should be the main ones. Imminent did a report. Indeed. Yeah, I have the, the imminent report behind me. I should plug that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyways, moving on from India. Thank yeah. you so much, Kirti, for, for all of that. John, you've been doing this report for, gosh, you said since 2000? No. You said 2003. 2003. Still, yeah. that is 20 years, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What are the latest, and I, we probably hit on this, but in 2023, what are the trends, not so much that are noticeable today, but what's mm -hmm. your speculation about what's the next big thing? for web i remember a year two years ago like metaverse 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 right every facebook right. changed their name to meta uh, yeah see you right. have the same reaction as me which is the eye roll right yeah. yeah and i think you know metaverse is coming i don't think we're ready for it yet right yeah. i think it was yeah. the right thing at the wrong time mm -hmm. um but when we're talking about metaverse we're talking about chat gpt we're talking about 5g all of these things that are influencing the mm -hmm. way we consume content online mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on what's the next big thing coming down the line that we need to be aware of well i i you know ai is is kind of hard to ignore you sure. know but i think the, the big thing isn't so much the the language engines it's how do websites manage that hmm. you know manage that on a consumer facing you know, we're using it already on the back end, but right. uh, consumer facing. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of potential there. And, you know, we're seeing some signs of how it can be done through Airbnb. Um, so many other companies, though, I'm, I'm still, I, I know why some have, have been hesitant and reluctant. And there's some industry sectors that are going to be the last to use it and, and may never use it, a regulated industry, you know, uh, uh, medical device manufacturer, for example, could be very right. <laughs> reluctant right. and understandably so. But um, I think that is definitely key. Um, also, the, the multilingual user experience. You know, we talk a lot about the link, you know, what... Uh, Many pe people speak multiple languages, yeah. to Curtis point. And how do you manage that? How do you capture multiple language settings and then ele elegantly have fallbacks, you know? And we're, we're seeing that, you know, we see that with the socials they've done, uh, they've tried to capture that because of course they can sell ads against multiple languages. So they want to capture your multiple language preferences. Um, you know, the internet uh, has had that uh, built in through language negotiation or a browser, we can have fallbacks built in through a browser. Um, but a lot of companies, you know, they're still a long way from getting to managing that. But th they, that to me is going to be a big, a big thing as well, because this idea that everyone fits in one language silo is, is, you know, in the U.S., for example, you know, between Spanish and English is, is, not necessarily applicable you know you can't make assumptions that they want maybe they want spanish for for these websites english for these websites or spanish for these experiences english for these experiences uh what what i look at a lot is is netflix and how they're managing languages and how we as consumers are you know we're we're suddenly hit we have access to all of this content now in all these different languages um well and it, that it, is collectively changed. changing us it's changing yeah. us it's changing yeah. per global per or at least in the us it's changing global right. perceptions yeah i mean i shouldn't speak for all of my people but mm -hmm. in america it's like 10 years ago even i would say watching foreign movies like you were considered like a film snob that, you know what I'm saying? Like no yeah. one like watched foreign movies unless you yeah. like identified as that type of person who watches foreign movies. Right? right. And nowadays with Netflix, it's opening us up to this idea that, I mean, look at all of the good stuff coming out of South Korea. 
for crying out loud, right? And it's opening us up to this idea that, oh, there's awesome creators, I would say even better creators, than what's coming out of the traditional places, you know, Hollywood, Nollywood, Bollywood. And it's really opening opening people's minds to that idea of having foreign foreign experiences. Yeah. I would say experiences. I, I, and I to your point, we we are gonna the whole world is changing. And that that's what I get really excited about this field and what we do. Um, and what the you know what what uh, all the technology can do, you know, in terms of opening minds and unlocking content and unlocking culture that you know, like you said, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have seen half of the entertainment I've seen in the past year on Netflix. So it's exciting. Well, let's, before I uh, start wrapping it up here with my final questions, let's just check in on, on Kirti over here, who is our third guest, it seems, for the day. Uh, digital presence and language need to be covered for India. I would say, okay, we said that. The next step beyond content, would it not be communication, real-time communication, more UGC and video, uh, user-generated content and yeah. video in many languages? Yeah, here, here, because I think these are kind of some of the things that have been cost prohibitive. Um, user-generated content is a big one, mm -hmm. and this takes us to the, the Airbnb case, for example. Mm -hmm. But... Being it because user generated content isn't cost effective to send through traditional workflows, traditional localization workflows. So, this is where technology is coming in saying, not so much. I mean, these are things video as well, real time communication as well. These are all things we've had solutions for real time communication for thousands of years. It's called interpretation, right? <laughs> Right. What's changing is nowadays technology is making it cost effective to be able to provide these services. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Kirti. Um, final question, a little bit of a self-serving question or a shameless plug for you. Where can I find, where can people listening to this, the recording, find the, the, the report card? Uh, yeah, it's at uh, bite level dot com, B Y T E level dot com. And the, now my blog, which I pull, and we'll continue to pull research from the report is globalbydesign.com. So bite level, globalbydesign.com. There you have it, guys. Anything I forgot to ask you, John, as we're wrapping up here? No, I, I think you I think you did. You uh, you covered flags. I'm glad I got that in. Okay. Well, we'll complain more about flags next year when when we're talking about the 2024 report card. Let's see if my music works. Now, if I fix that, ladies, gentlemen, we are out of time for today. Thank you all for joining me on this episode of Nimsy Live. If you enjoyed us, or if you enjoyed this Nimsy Live experience, then you can join us next time on March 29th when we're talking with Veronica DiMartino from Eventbrite about language inclusivity and accessibility. If you're not already signed up, head on over to our LinkedIn page and you can sign up right there. I appreciate our guest today, John Juncker. I appreciate my colleagues here at NIMSY Insights doing all of the hard work so I can have these fun conversations. I appreciate everybody in our industry who fills out NIMSY surveys and schedules briefings with our analysts so we can include all of you in our public or published industry research. And lastly, I appreciate you, the audience, who are joining us live today or if you're watching the recording all of the dialogue and chat and everybody who left comments and questions and i look forward to next time have a great day Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Tucker. Take care.